Hi, I'm Jeff Jarvis. I'm a professor at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. As a journalist, I've been interested in how we've been covering this crisis, and I believe we've got to amplify the experts and start to the experts, so I'm talking to some experts. So uh, uh, this is my second uh, recorded interview here, and I'm going to uh, Dr. Kapali, who is at the IDSA, the Infectious Diseases Society of America, with other affiliations, which she'll describe in a moment. Um, and yesterday, I talked with Greg Consalves from Yale, who's an epidemiologist. So, Doctor, can we start by just saying what is your expertise, and why and when should journalists come to you and colleagues in your end of the field? Sure, I think that's a really wonderful question. So, I'm an infectious disease physician. So, I'm a clinical uh, researcher. So, I have experience in global health. I've spent a fair amount of time on the ground, both in Asia and in Africa. I was the medical director for an Ebola treatment unit in West Africa during the 2014 Ebola outbreak. And since then, I've also got a fair amount of experience on um, standing up uh, healthcare systems um, for preparedness activities, uh, internationally and domestically. My interest is in um, outbreak response, biosecurity, and health systems preparedness. So, and, and you want to mention further the, the affiliations you have? Sure. My affiliations, um, so I'm the vice chair of the Infectious Diseases Society of America Global Health Committee. Um, the Infectious Disease Society of America is the national professional society for all um, infectious diseases physicians in the United States. And I'm also a emerging leader and biosecurity fellow at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Thank you. Um, so first, I just want to ask whether you have any view about what you've seen in media coverage of this outbreak and, and what you think bad and good. Sure. I think that, you know, one of the things that's been quite astounding to me is the amount of media coverage. Obviously, we've never lived in a time like this before, um, that meaning a pandemic. So um, it's only expected now that we're going to have this kind of media coverage. Additionally, we have uh, the rise of social media, which is different and new. Uh, so that's also added a different dimension to the rise of uh, the coverage because we live in what I like to call a quote unquote on-demand society. So we have information being released almost in real time. And um, while that can be good, um, it is almost like a, what we like to call a hose of information being released and trying to uh, keep up with it can be challenging at times. So I started a Twitter list of 500 epidemiologists, virologists, infectious diseases experts, physicians on the front line, NGOs, and so on. And you're one of the stars in that list, and I've learned a lot from you there. That's why I asked you for this to take your time off your very busy schedule to talk to me. Um, talk a minute about, about how journalists should be judging what there's the science they're seeing pass by in real time in Twitter. I'm fascinated by Twitter. I'm loving it because I'm, the, the hope I find is in science, in all of this, and in seeing you experts and doctors comparing notes, asking questions, giving answers, asking more questions, um, trying to get to shared understanding. Uh, that gives me tremendous hope. But of course, I'm an amateur and in many ways an idiot, and I don't know what I'm seeing. And journalists are, uh, there, there are very few science and medicine reporters left. We train them at our school, but there aren't many left, especially at local newspapers. So uh, how should we judge uh, what we see passing by in medical Twitter, in expert Twitter, not in idiot Twitter, but in expert <laughs> Twitter? Um, and before starting to do with a story, how should we approach that and then what should, how should we come to the experts? Sure. I think that's a really good question, and I do, definitely do think it's a challenge. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that you can always do is um, when you see somebody um, who is con a considered a quote-unquote expert, um, I always think it's a good idea to look up their credentials. And especially in this particular case, you want somebody who's going to have infectious diseases experience. May they be an epidemiologist or a clinician. You're going to want somebody who's got virology experience. Um, I think those types of things are very important. Um, I think it's also really important to keep in mind that um, not all physicians are the same, right? And so um, infectious diseases is a very specialized field. And so you wouldn't want somebody who's 
a surgeon necessarily talking about infectious diseases, just like you wouldn't want me as an infectious disease doctor talking about surgery. Um, it's not what I do. Um, so you want to make sure that the people that you're going to have the appropriate uh, background and the appropriate um, history. And I think that's the other important thing is you want to make sure that the people who've been doing this are not quote unquote new to the game. Uh, whenever you have something such as this that is um, for lack of a better word, high profile, you're gonna have people that are opportunistic both on both sides, both on the um, media side, but also in our profession. And I think it's incumbent on uh, people on both sides to make sure that they're speaking and getting accurate truth out there. So it's important for the journalists to do their job, uh, but I would like to think and hope that people in my profession are going to represent themselves accurately um, but you can't always count on that. So everybody has to do their vetting on both sides. And triangulate and try to find more than one expert, I think, and more than one source uh, yes, as well. Um, I'll confess that I made a mistake um, uh, probably about two weeks ago when that first um, hydrochloroquine uh, of like N equals 16 or whatever it was came out. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. Uh, I saw it as what it was. I just retweeted it. And mm -hmm little can one know now how that can end up in the mind and mouth of the president of the United States mm -hmm. without context. Um, uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think that's an absolutely fair point, right? And that just hasn't happened in the media world. That's happened in the lay public as well. And so then it becomes very difficult for those of us who are in medicine, um, who, especially those of us who are actually uh, the specialists in this area, so infectious diseases, trying to walk it back. Um, so now I spend a lot of time answering questions about that very small study that has numerous problems with it. So it was A, small. It was not matched appropriately. Um, uh, it was not powered for efficacy. Things that, uh, you know, for those of us who are in the scientific field, we think about and we understand. Uh, however, people who are not in the scientific field, they just hear the headline, which is this drug looks good, we should give it to everybody. And so then what happens are people trying to get the drug, they're taking it, um, side effects happen, um, we've had people unfortunately die because they've taken it, and those are very disturbing things. So when, when you professionally see something like that pass by, and I presume even a tiny and flawed and bad study, you put that in your database of your head and say, well, yeah, that might be interesting, might be worth something to pursue. There's a, there's a chain of things you're going to expect before you pay attention to that. I, I saw, uh, I think it was today, you put up a PowerPoint of a presentation you gave on both treatments and vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, was that, was, that was to, who was that to, if I may, I can't remember. Sure. Um, I have a colleague of mine that uh, is at MD Anderson in Texas, and they uh, asked me to give a talk to their uh, fellows and the rest of their staff about COVID-19. So I did a Zoom talk yesterday about COVID-19, clinical presentations, uh, some information applicable to their immune compromised population, and then also gave a talk about some of the therapeutics that we're looking at. And because of the uh, excitement that has now been seen with the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, uh, I talked about that study and uh, what some of the um, questions we had with that study. Um, so how should journalists cover uh, treatments and vaccines at this, at this stage in this story? Yeah, you know, I think um, one of the ways to cover it is, I think one of the things you mentioned, right? So I would definitely let the science lead. I would make sure to talk to a number of experts and um, get various viewpoints. And I think as time goes on, um, one of the things that is important is you will develop relationships with people in the scientific field and learn who the people are that you can talk to who understand what they're talking about. And I think that's very important. Um, I think it's very important not to overblow anything at this point because all the data we've seen has been small. And in science, uh, the gold standard type of study is gonna be a blinded, randomized, controlled study. And we have those studies currently ongoing, but they have not come out yet. And so anything that is 
going to be very small. While that might have some promising information, at this point, that's not going to be enough for us how, to say, oh, this is great. How long should we expect those? Uh, I think it's WHO is, has, has pushed those. How long is it going to take for those studies to, to reveal data that you will start to see as revelatory? Yeah, I think um, hopefully in the next you know couple of weeks or so we'll get some information. Sometimes it's hard to know um, because because we have studies that have started in China already, right? So mm -hmm. there's studies with remdesivir that were started in China. Um, so you know we might get some data from that, uh, and then they have things called data safety monitoring boards that will uh, sometime intermittently look at the data. Uh, and so if there's promising information, then we might get information early. Uh, WHO has started their trial called the Solidarity Trial, which is a forearm study looking at various therapeutics. Um, that will probably be a bit. Um, you know, part of the issue also is, is that now we have to make sure we're enrolling people in these trials so we get the data we need. So if we're, you know, giving people medications um, you know, quote unquote, off label, then those people are not getting enrolled in the study. And so we lose that data. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, uh, call upon you as an assignment editor here and just go down a few things and, and get, that's exactly what I'm, what I'm looking for is that kind of advice. Uh, so, so uh, vaccines, what should we be looking for? How long is it going to take before we have news that is actually worth reporting? <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Dr. Fauci on this one, and it's going to be at least a year to 18 months. Um, they just started the phase one of the Moderna trial um, about two weeks ago, and it's going to take some time to get that phase one data. And then if that, if that data looks good, then they move into the phase two, phase three study. I think one of the things that Dr. Fauci said recently that I think is really important is that if that data looks good, um, Typically, we would wait until the phase two, phase three data comes, and then they would start ramping up production. What they're going to try and do is get the companies to invest in producing the vaccine while the phase two, three study is ongoing. So we don't have to wait if that data looks good to ramp up production of the vaccine. So that would help um, there not be a lag time. But it's going to be a while, and I think people yes. need to understand that. And, and, and what is it that, that scientists are looking for in those studies? I, I, efficacy and, and harm? Uh, uh, what are they going to yeah. be looking for? Yeah, so a couple of things, right? So in the phase ones, they're going to look for, they are using different doses in patients. Um, uh, and then they will look to see how, you know, first they're going to look for adverse reactions and they're going to look for efficacy. And then um, depending on what that looks like, then they move to the phase two, three, which will be, more patients um, and looking for some of the same things. Great. All right. Next question. Uh, transmission. Uh, mechanisms of transmission. And I see in medical Twitter debates about aerosol or no. We're obviously seeing lots of debates constantly about the masks. Uh, let us stipulate <laughs> that the first masks, no matter what, should go to uh, healthcare workers. But um, yeah. uh, you've had such experience around infectious diseases. It is your specialty. So what, how do we cover that story about transmission? Beyond the obvious, of course, wash your hands. All that advice we know, but in the controversies we're seeing now, I don't think I see very good coverage. No, I mean, I think that that's a great question. I also think, just like you pointed out, it's still extremely controversial. And I think even within the medical community, there's a lot of uh, back and forth about what is best. And we're trying to see if we can have some of the um, larger agencies try and come up with a quote unquote consensus statement. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, we don't have a lot of great scientific information, so that makes it hard. And we're still learning about the transmission dynamics of the virus. Um, you know, we know that you can transmit uh, about 24 hours before you start having symptoms. So I think there are a lot of dynamics about the transmission itself that make it hard to make some of these recommendations. And then, like you said, we have a shortage, right? So that, that adds into it. Where are you coming down on masks uh, lately for the public? For the public. Um, so I think right now, because of the shortage of masks, yes. um, I think that really, you know, I'm going to push them towards the frontline workers. Yes. Um, I really try to uh, really try to uh, push for the public to maintain the public health um, recommendations that have been out there, which is 
stay at home. <laughs> Don't go out, stay at home. If you have to go home, uh, go out, maintain your distance. Because we know that if you're in close contacts, that is how you're going to transmit the virus, right? So if you're remaining um, adherent to those measures, then um, then I, I'm not gonna have to worry as much. Yeah. Uh, so that's where I'm leaning right now. Next topic that I think we have trouble with, uh, especially those of us who are math challenged, is modeling. Um, <laughs> and and we you know we saw Dr. Burks up yesterday uh, trying to put up large charts and show that we've seen the the debates between the Imperial College and the Oxford models in the UK. Um, journalists, as I like to say, tend to think that the latest word is the last word, and they just want the one model to to to, to point to, and they don't understand, or it's difficult for us to understand how big the ranges can be and how big the differences and dis disagreements can be and, and how much new data uh, has an impact on, on how we judge those models. So what advice do you have for journalists trying to understand these epidemiological models uh, and how they should cover that and the expectations that are the public? Yeah, so I think the you know the whole thing about modeling too is it's a you know very complicated you know even myself I, that's not what I do and I have challenges at times understanding the modeling. Um, I think you have to understand um, it from the big picture that you know they're looking at worst case scenarios, best case scenarios, and they're um, and then there's going to be somewhere in between. And I think that is probably the most important thing. You know that Imperial College of London study that came out a couple of weeks ago predicting 2.2 million deaths in the United States, that was without any mitigation measures being implemented. And so then they, you know, implemented all these mitigation measures, but they're all theoretical models, right? So um, we're going to fall somewhere in between there. And I think that's really important to, for people to keep in mind. Do you think San Francisco is in better shape than had been predicted, or do you say the jury's out? I would say the jury is out. You know, one of the big challenges we have in San Francisco um, and California overall is, um, you know, we have a, we're a state of 40 million people. We haven't even done 100,000 tests yet. And um, we have over 50,000 tests that are still pending. Uh, so trying to understand what's going on with the outstanding tests, um, I'm not quite sure. I've been trying to figure that out myself. I know one of the big problems has also been the same thing that's been a problem everywhere, the swabs. Um, so that's been an issue in the testing. So I know that we're not capturing a lot of people who are positive because you have to be very sick in order to get a test to start with. Um, in an ideal world, which Lord knows we are not in, and we had uh, abundant tests, and we have a mechanism to trace, as other countries are, are implementing, and we're, as far as I can tell, not. Um, how much impact would that have on the spread of the disease if we had test and trace besides also uh, uh, isolation? Sure, it would have a tremendous impact. Um, we don't know where to put our resources uh, if we don't know where the disease is. And so now we're in a situation where we're trying to guess, we're trying to model, maybe correctly, maybe not so much, um, where things are gonna pop up. And so I knew, we know from prior outbreaks that if you don't test, you don't know where your disease is, so then you don't know where to implement your measures. And then we have this other very challenging situation in the United States where we are doing different things in different places. So in California, we're sheltering in place, but in other states, um, they have not implemented those measures. So we don't have a uniform policy in the United States at this point either, which adds to the challenges that we are having. So one story that I don't think I've seen covered much at all yet is the story of equity and this disease or inequity. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the poor uh, undocumented immigrants, uh, the uninsured, uh, homeless, um, and, and I just fear that there's a there's a, a bomb waiting out there. And people in, in this economy, more people are going to be poor, mm -hmm. and 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 off insurance and so on. Um, and I think part of your specialty is looking at issues of equity. Uh, yes. How should that story? If, if if you could if you could corral five journalists and tell them to cover that story, how how where should they look? 
I think that's another great question. So we know infectious diseases disproportionately affect those who are disenfranchised. So I think that we need to look, if we're going to look at the United States as a whole, we need to look at those areas where you have high population density and also look at the populations that are disenfranchised, right? So um, uh, lower socioeconomic areas. And we're seeing that. We know New Orleans, um, Atlanta, uh, Detroit, Chicago, those areas are having their epidemic um, take off. And we need to look at the populations that are being affected there. And then we need to also look at what can we do to get those people tested? What can we do to get the people who may be at risk out of um, whatever living situations they might be in that may be putting them at risk? We need to work on developing those things. And so it is a, th this outbreak is a broader discussion on um, healthcare in our society, on the um, social dynamics in our society, uh, things that we have long um, shied away debating because they are difficult things to address. You know, I talked to Dr. Gonsalves yesterday. He's, I mean, this is, seemed to be an international story and a national story, but it's going to become a local story very, very quickly uh, in terms of how specific communities in specific cities and states uh, are being treated and are not. Right. And, you know, and I, I will take it, you know, further because I am a, I'm a person who works in global health, you know, I think we need to think about, um, you know, uh, places more globally, right? Africa. I'm very worried about the African continent, um, a place that's very near and dear to my heart, Sierra Leone, where I spent many months fighting the Ebola outbreak. Uh, they had their first documented case um, yesterday. This is a country of over 7 million people. They have one ventilator for the entire country. Oh, I'm very worried about that. Um, I'm worried about the DRC. They are just coming off of uh, fighting a very long Ebola outbreak. They're on their countdown to getting to zero for Ebola, and they are now having cases of COVID-19 in the North Kivu area. Um, I also worry about India. India has the population density issues of China without the ability to um, scale up their infrastructure the way that China does. So I think there are very many other areas um, globally that we need to think about and be very concerned about at this point as well. And isn't the paradox there that, that, that we're shutting borders, which you know, is dear to the hearts of some people uh, by coincidence, and, and cutting off connections. When, when I saw some, um, I think it was the president of Germany today tied with some other uh, world leaders trying to say that, no, 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 this is the time when we must connect more across the world. This is when we have to share uh, information and resources. Uh, but it sounds like we're doing kind of the opposite uh, politically. Um, yeah, so it's definitely a very important time for us to all come together. We need to learn from each other. We need to learn from um, our successes and our challenges. So we, we should look to the countries that are ahead of us in this outbreak. We should look to China and see what they've learned. We need to look to Italy and Spain and countries um, throughout Europe. Uh, we also need to learn from the successes of countries that have dealt with De devastating infectious diseases and see what we can learn. Um, I think that we are so used to in the United States, which is a resource rich country, to being able to do everything and not having limitations. Being a person who's worked in resource limited countries, um, I'm used to working with very limited things. May that be um, uh, laboratory tests, may that be uh, therapeutics, may that be um, PPE even. But I think we need to look to the people who have those experiences and learn from those experiences because we don't have the luxury of having everything right now and we need to figure out how we're going to adapt so we can move forward. Right. We're used to throwing money at it and even those who did not have the money to throw at it were able to still be victorious in the end. I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear with your experience in, in HIV as well, right? And Ebola. Mm -hmm. um, that's a hard job. Um, and, and, you know, we're seeing doctors on the front line now. You've been on that front line. Um, how, if I may ask you this personal, uh, how is it emotionally to see um, something like this spread? Scientifically, it, it's, I'm sure you would never just, just uh, pull yourself apart to see it this way, but it's, it's, it's fascinating. There's a lot of data, there's a lot of experience you have, you want people to be able to hear, 
but it's but you've also been there and and witnessed it. And I saw you on Twitter, I think, today talking with others about the, I don't know if you call it PTSD or not, but the but the memories that that are ingrained now in you. How how do you how do you grapple with your job? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question, and it's another one that we don't talk a lot about in our society. Um, so for me, when I came back from West Africa, it was a really hard time. Uh, I felt very empty. I had a very difficult time reacclimating this society. Nothing really felt like it had meaning. And I really felt like my mind was still over in Sierra Leone. Um, it took a really long time for me to have some sense of normalcy again. Um, my situation was compounded by the fact that I was quarantined for 21 days and I also got admitted to um, a hospital to get ruled out for Ebola. So I um, had a fever after I came back and so uh, due to various things that were ongoing, they wanted me to be admitted and get ruled out. So all those things were very challenging and um, I think that when I came back after being in the field where every day felt like a year, I had some time to let my brain and my body rest and then it was my body was like oh wow what did you just go through and your your mind has to process that and not just me everybody i know was deeply affected by that and you know to this day i'm still not the same uh for better or for worse it's affected me and i worry about our frontline physicians now um all over the world um we're gonna have a uh, frontline clinicians, nurses, physicians, other healthcare workers who lose their life um, to this virus because they get infected. And then we're gonna have those that have problems with um, acute stress reaction, PTSD, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and they're gonna have struggles. And I don't think that we're thinking about that enough yet and how to support those people. And also, you know, we're talking about graduating medical students early and throwing them on the front lines. And I think we really need to think about that because um, these are people who don't have that experience and putting them in harm's way to, to deal with these issues without the proper support uh, could be devastating. The medical ethical issues that we're now seeing coming into the popular press that, that you deal with professionally frighten us civilians to death because these are very, very hard decisions that are being made. And, and, I, and I, I think it's an excellent point that, that until you have the confidence, it could be scarring. And even, even if you do have the confidence and do have the experience, it still, as you say, rests with you forever. Let me ask you uh, yeah. two more questions. Um, uh, f first, uh, both on media. First, is there any angle to this that we're not covering, that you wish got more coverage, that you wish got more attention on TV or in the newspapers uh, that is, is looming out there and you know it's there, but you're not seeing it? Yeah, so I think a couple things. I think one of the ones we touched on a bit, um, what can we learn from other countries who've dealt with devastating infectious diseases outbreaks? Mm -hmm. I think we have a lot to learn and I think we need to learn from them uh, so we can be, more effective in what we're doing. Um, I think the other thing that I wish that we covered more is uh, really how reactive the United States has been in our approach. Um, you know, we went to being reactive about PPE and reactive about testing swabs and testing and reactive about ventilators and um, we're not being proactive and thinking what's coming down the line. And I'm worried that um, the next issue is going to be, we don't have enough dialysis machines. Um, people who get very sick with um, uh, what we call sepsis, which is um, a whole, you know, multi-organ failure. In addition to needing ventilation, they need, um, they may need support of their kidneys with dialysis. And that's not something that I've heard our administration discuss. And so I'm worried we're going to be in the same issue that we're now with ventilators. And I think we need to have these discussions about okay, we're here, but let's look ahead to the other things we need to think about. And again, I think the third issue that I that we just touched upon is um, the support for the, our frontline physicians and also the people who've been in the hospital. It's um, very traumatizing and we need to think about how we're going to support these people. So you mentioned uh, before we got on the air, 
that you've been doing suddenly media appearances, which I think I take as an excellent thing because you're an expert and the, and the media are coming to you. How has that experience been? Uh, what's good and bad about uh, suddenly you're finding yourself being interviewed here or anywhere? Yeah. Um, well, it's been definitely a new experience. Um, I, I appreciate that people want to hear what I have to say. Um, it, it, it's a little bit humbling for me because, again, in my opinion, I'm just going about talking about the things that I've always talked about, thinking about the things I've always thought about, uh, but now it's everybody's interested in it. So um, I am glad that people think that uh, I'm an expert and I still kind of get a little bit weirded out about that, but I'm happy to talk about it uh, because I think it's important to get the correct information as much as we can out there. Um, I think at times it can be a little bit overwhelming just because it's a lot. And I think at times also it can be a lot because there, um, you know, there is other work to be done. And so both me and my colleagues, we all want to be helpful as much as we can, uh, and work to get the correct information out there. And, and we worry sometimes that if we don't give it, then the media might go on to somebody else who is willing to talk, but doesn't have the correct information. So it's trying to balance that. Well, and I, and I thank you very, very much for taking precious time out to do, to do this. So, so I, li I lied, I have one last question. Sure. Uh, whom else uh, would you recommend uh, that we follow, that I talk to uh, uh, people and, and again, Specialties. Sure. Um, so I think if you want a great modeler, Bell Hanage is great mm -hmm. from Harvard. Uh, I think if you want virologists, you've got Angie Rasmussen, Jason Kindrachuk, um, and I think if you want other clinicians, um, Mouj Sevik, she's at St. Mm -hmm. Andrews. Um, you've got the group at Emory University, which is where I trained. Um, they've got a First class team, I would recommend um, Anish Mehta or Colleen Kraft over there. Uh, you've got the group at UNMC, which um, you've got uh, James Lawler, David Brett Major, and um, John Lowe over there. And so they're part of the National Ebola Training and Education Center that was uh, developed by Asper five years ago during Ebola. And they really don't just work in Ebola, but it's really all special pathogens. And so it's a really good group of uh, people and a consortium of people that have come together. Uh, so I think, um, you know, like we talked about earlier, it's important to have uh, people in various um, parts of infectious diseases. So you've got your virologists, you've got your modelers, you've got your epidemiologists and um, your clinicians. And you get a fuller picture then. Yeah, Dr. yeah, because we all do different things. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your expertise. And thank you for your time. You're welcome. Appreciate Thanks it. for talking.